Ja, och kuss. Hello everybody, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, afternoon or evening, depending where you're zooming into our panel discussion from. I am sad to say that this is the last panel and last event of the Trust for Sustainable Living's 2022 Climate Justice Summit, but I am really pleased to say we've got a wonderful moderator and team of panellists to join us today as we discuss addressing economic and social inequality to combat the climate crisis. So I'm going to hand straight over to Barry, our wonderful moderator, to introduce himself, and then he'll be handing over to the panellists. So thank everyone. Enjoy the session. Thank you for being with us. Over to thank you, Barry. You. Thank you, Kirsty. I'm Barry. I, I'm a scientist. I work mostly nowadays on CO2 capture. So I've obviously got an interest in the, in the climate change and the crisis. Um, but less about me, more about our panellists. Could I ask our panellists to introduce themselves very briefly? Um, and Anthea, perhaps you could go first. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Anthea Lorenz and I am a final year environmental engineering student at the Dimopoulos University of Thrace in Greece. I'm originally from the Seychelles Islands and I have been an environmental activist since I participated in the TSL uh, international SN debates in 2012. And ever since I have been uh, in every activities concerning environment in Seychelles and uh, even internationally. Thanks, Anthea. Janae, perhaps you can introduce yourself next. Good day, everyone. My name is Janae Peart, and I was the former 2016 grand prize winner for this competition, for the essay competition. Currently, I'm a law student at the Norman Manley Law School in Jamaica, and I'm also an associate at Above or Beyond. What I've been doing since 2016 for the environment, I remember in 2019, I actually marched with the students at UWI, was University of the West Indies in Trinidad and Tobago. And since then I've made sure that in my law courses, I've been doing international environmental law and been a constant participant in our environmental club. So, so far that's what I've been doing. Thank you, Jay. Filippo. Yes, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Filippo Berardi. I work at the Global Environment Facility, um, which is a um, uh, one of the sort of main climate funds that are uh, part of the international climate change uh, regime. Uh, I can talk more about that uh, later, but a bit more about myself. I'm uh, I'm also a lawyer uh, by training. Uh, many many years ago, I I graduated in international environmental law with a thesis on uh, the Kyoto Protocol and its application in, in the EU that was 2003. So it's been uh, almost uh, 20 years uh, of, of my career focusing on, on climate change from different angles, uh, from the finance angle, from the environmental offsets angle, and then more recently um, as, uh, as a climate change specialist uh, at the JAF and the World Bank um, to support developing countries in their transition to uh, to low carbon and, and, and decarbonized economies. Thank you, Felipe. I th we thought it would be useful perhaps next if, if our panelists could um, make an opening statement, really explaining how they're connected to the topic of our debate, how it resonates with them, what excites them about it. It's really very personal for them and you know, a chance for them to say what they feel about the topic. So in less than five minutes each if that's feasible guys because i'd like to get on some of the questions later but anthea why don't you go first thank you barry um i i as i have said i am an environmental activist since very young in 2012 um and uh, i started being active trying to uh, raise awareness in uh about climate change, about environmental protection, about living sustainably and things like that. But then later on, when as I grew up and realized that maybe we need to form part of the policy making uh, and things like that, and we realized that maybe we don't have the capacity, the necessary resources and capital to do that as well. 
And uh, we never thought of it as inequalities, but then when you take a step back and look at it glow, uh, like from afar, you realize they were inequalities for us young people and we could not uh, access uh, these uh, decision-making things because we didn't have the resources as well. And in Seychelles, we are proud that almost everyone is aware about the climate change, but still there's a little bit of things that we can do to uh, reduce the inequalities. And uh, that's how I feel like it, it's personal to me as a young person from a seed, Seychelles is a small island state, developing state and uh, from the global south as well. And we are very vulnerable to the climate change, to the impacts. We, with the years uh, passing by, realize that every day is a battle in trying to survive uh, its impacts. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Anthea. Look forward to quizzing you on some of those topics a bit later on and getting your views. Janae, perhaps, perhaps you could go next. So how does the topic resonate with me? Well, I've always been very interested in climate change and sustainable development overall. That's also why I wanted to do environmental law. And in going through the material, one thing that really resonated with me was the fact that even though we always know what the right thing is to do, there are a lot of competing interests that a lot of countries have to face when they're trying to implement certain policies. Maybe their economic issues, or maybe their crime issues that some people think might take priority in the short term. And then they're more concerned about that as opposed to climate change, even though that's a very, very important issue. And so I've always wondered, how do you find a balance between them and to bring into the conversation the idea of being able to put the planet first as well as considering all the other factors that need to be thought of when you're putting in place policies. And because I was very aware of the economic implications of these mitigation factors that we tend to consider when we're talking about climate change, I've always said that there must be a better way, a way that we can implement policies that consider the local circumstances of every single country. And it's not a blanket statement or a blanket attitude towards everyone. So that's how I've connected to it. Thank you, Janae. Thank you. And Felipe, please. Well, I mean, on, a, on a personal level, I think, uh, I mean, it was about 20 years ago when I was trying to figure out what I liked about my law school. Uh, and, and certainly uh, environmental law and international law were the two area where I felt more connected and, 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 and I was a young activist on social issues and, and social rights. And, and obviously the environment I mentioned uh, was starting to come up uh, in, in the sort of uh, radar of young people uh, back then. But the situation we have to remember and we have to perhaps understand was very different. Uh, there was no awareness and no uh, youth engagement around uh, issues related to climate change 20 years ago. Uh, and, uh, and, and to be honest, in my law school, I was the first student um, focusing on the Kyoto Protocol from a legal standpoint. Uh, my own law professor asked me to do uh, work and around that because he didn't have a knowledge of that particular component of the uh, international uh, legal regime and, and how that sort of uh, should have been developed going forward. Uh, it, it was just the year uh, uh, when the Kyoto Protocol had entered into force and the convention, uh, it's, it's only uh, from 1992. So it was starting uh, getting our heads around how can uh, you know, the, the, the legal regime be uh, developed, further built on, uh, and it took uh, about 10 more years to get to the Paris Agreement. So it's a long, it's a long process, but back then it was for me, uh, extremely uh, interesting and 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 not just for the environment but obviously uh, for some of the themes that are being discussed today uh, in relation to uh, global justice uh, and in relation to how do we um, uh, sort of uh, use the environment to eventually also uh, serve 
um, social uh, objectives and, and closing the gaps uh, between uh, countries that, that have developed first, uh, uh, making the most of some of the finite uh, resources that the herd uh, has put available to humanity and, and, and how do we allow other countries to continue to develop uh, in a way that uh, is both fair, but also compatible uh, to our long-term uh, environmental and temperature goals. Uh, so it is a very, very difficult nut to crack. Uh, and, and how do I draw the line between allowing uh, and between supporting developments that follow uh, in a way a pattern that was proven to be not sustainable uh, for countries that have industrialized first. Uh, and so how do I draw the line between uh, um, sort of uh, continuing to use that pattern in the name of global development uh, and uh, uh, transition or, or ask or push for transitioning to an alternative uh, development uh, uh, um, sort of model uh, for those countries that still have uh, quite a long way to go to catch up. So I think that's, uh, for me, uh, one of the most important and, and sort of interesting issue that is um, uh, eventually permeating the entire debate under the UN, UN system, under the UN convention, uh, and, and to some extent, uh, this long-standing uh, contraposition between the two blocks of the developed and the developing countries of which obviously uh, SIDS and, and LDCs are the two um, most important constituencies. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we'll come back to SIDS later because we've got essentially two representatives of SIDS on the panel. Um, and the other thing, I, I, I think a, a theme which we're going to have throughout, I, there are a lot of um, young people, school children listening to this debate. And I'd like to get, get them pointed towards some perhaps resources which will help them understand some of the issues. Um, so as we talk along, you know, please feel free to throw out resources as they, as they come to your mind. So I'm really interested in understand where do you get your understanding of the issues and where can other people tap into that great understanding? So that, that would be really useful. So, um, okay, let's go on to a more general discussion and we're prompted by a few questions. And although perhaps I direct initially question to an individual other panelists please do join in so it reflects your experience and understanding of the topics so i was going to start with with young people and and really to anthea who is representative a young person's representative um how do you think economic and social inequality impact young people in regard to the climate crisis as i have mentioned that uh, when we are young we, we don't realize how much uh, there is out there. We think that only by uh, doing climate strikes or uh, little things or living sustainably, creating awareness around that, it will uh, go and combat the climate crisis. But then when you grow up, you realize that you need to form part of the policy making decision, things like that. And when uh, you realize maybe it's a, you feel a little bit intimidated and think, am I ready to form part of this? And maybe you are lucky to get training uh, to attend COI or COP, the process, the conferences, and uh, you have uh, the baggage and then uh, you need funding to attend these things. And then you go knock on doors to try to find funding to attend uh, this policy making process. And Seychelles, we are lucky that the government the community support us and uh, we can actually access a little bit of fun to attend these things. But if you access to things, you can form part of it. And uh, I was part of the Seeds Youth, Youth in Hub. It, it's a Indian Ocean uh, hub about climate change, climate advocacy. And uh, after that, we worked a lot to to get some young people to attend the COI uh, and the COP. So we try to get young people there and has, have at least some representative. And uh, as well, social, not everyone has the economic background, the family background from rich or poor to attend these things or get access to this kind of uh, education as well. So it's a little bit of drawback for us 
So we have to find ways to go around that and try to get our voices out there and uh, participate and be active in decisions that will affect us later. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Janae Filippo, have you got anything to add to that? Okay. Oh. Yeah, Janae, you go first. Uh, you, you hit the button, the unmute button, a fraction of a second faster than Filippo. Good reactions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, as it concerns young people in particularly these small island development states and how social and economic conditions impact them when it comes to climate change, one thing that I've really come to realize is the fact that a lot of small and developing states just have a lot, much, much smaller resources compared to more developed countries. And in countries like ours, we tend to have to focus um, on trying to create systems and create systems and build our constructions in certain ways so that we are not going to be as impacted by climate change as in the past, basically. And when you're trying to make the balance between the two, balancing creating policies that can help us versus creating policies that can help us in other spheres, as I think I've mentioned about economic, then there's a trade-off that has to be had. And it's a very difficult decision when you're planning for your future as a young person to say that, okay, I'm going to spend a little bit extra money to try and put forward more sustainable and more sustainable lifestyle instead of using certain plastic items will instead be using reusable or instead of using diesel or gasoline if you manage to be able to afford to drive then you would use electric vehicles which are just being introduced in our country now and when you think about those difficult decisions, that's what a lot of young people nowadays have to be thinking about. And when it comes to, that's the economic part of it. When it comes to the social aspect, I think Anthea also mentioned that not everyone has access to these resources, which is very unfortunate. In Jamaica, we've started to implement climate change into our education policies so that you learn it in school via biology if you're, doing biology because you have to select subjects when you go to high school, you don't necessarily do everything. So if you do a subject that you might fall underneath, then you'll be doing climate change. If you do geography, you'll be learning about climate change and so on and so forth. But if you do not have the opportunity, then you might not actually be aware that you actually need to be considering climate change and all the other dangers that face us in the next 20 years, next 10 years, next five years, even now. When you consider all of that, it really is a matter of inequality, even information inequality, mm -hmm. versus, and mm -hmm. also social, economic, and all of that. Yes, the information inequality is an interesting issue, which you know, I'm not sure we've got too much time to pick up on here, but so much so-called information out there about climate change on the internet is wrong, <laughs> and it's put out there maliciously. I think, and that's very worrying. How, how, how do people get to decide, make up their own minds whether this is right or wrong? Always very difficult, yes. Filippo, you had a, you had a-, a Thanks. Well, yeah. well perhaps, perhaps on that uh, last point, uh, a very, uh, th there are sort of widely recognized scientific sources <laughs> for, yes. for climate information. So, uh, you know, I, I would, sort of say that uh, it's perhaps the idea of having information on the internet is not necessarily what we want to uh, sort of communicate. Uh, uh, what we want to point people towards is uh, the IPCC uh, that is, uh, you know, a, a sort of quite conservative uh, body of scientific knowledge because it has to be agreed uh, from uh, by policymakers from all governments. So it basically the IPCC represents not the uh, uh, most uh, sort of, um, it, it, in some way it's watered down to make sure that it can be accepted by all, by all countries. So that represents a very solid 
conservative source of, of information. But going back to some of the points that, that were raised by my uh, fellow panelists, I mean, I, I completely agree there's, there's a significant need uh, to provide resources um, to developing countries, uh, in particular to uh, those that are most affected and have uh, yet to develop uh, capacity, both in terms of knowledge uh, and in terms of access to uh, technology uh, to be able to put their country on uh, a path uh, primarily that increase their ability to withstand the impacts uh, of climate change uh, that uh, inevitably are going to be felt and are already unfortunately be uh, uh, sort of noticed significantly with increased extreme weather events and you name it. Um, but also, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, provide uh, technology that are able to leapfrog uh, from uh, uh, some of the technology that exists today uh, to technologies that are completely decarbonized, try to avoid going through the sort of uh, meal piece approach and, and, and small steps that most developed and industrialized country have uh, uh, have gone through. And, and an example is, uh, for example, the, the, the whole debate on whether, uh, you know, natural gas uh, uh, should be considered as a transition technology. Uh, so right now there is a lot of debate and there's a lot of parties uh, and, and unsurprisingly uh, within the oil industry that are trying to push for natural gas as uh, the green alternative uh, without remembering that it's still uh, emit uh, uh, a significant amount of 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 uh, CO two and 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 produces methane. So, um, I work for an institution that, as a uh, the very reason for uh, of existence, uh, has that of trying to uh, collect uh, in a way and uh, and then channel and distribute funds from the industrialized world. Uh, to developing countries uh, uh, and to seeds and to least developed countries. Uh, and uh, this is uh, perhaps one of the, uh, the, the finance sort of cornerstone of the international uh, climate regime. Uh, and it was designed uh, specifically to create uh, a mechanism to ensure there is some level of social economic justice uh, when it comes to climate action. Uh, and then there is a way that is institutionalized and, and, and sort of like uh, created uh, as a mechanism um, in, the, in the climate regime for donors country to put money in a pot and for developing countries to then utilize a share of these available resources to do climate action in their countries. Uh, and, and the way we function is very much based on country drivenness. So our beneficiaries are generally able to decide how to use these resources. Are these resources enough? Uh, well, the answer is absolutely not. Uh, and, and you don't need me to, uh, to, uh, to remind you of the fact that we weren't even able as a global community uh, to put together that $100 billion, which is a meager, uh, uh, token uh, of what will be needed for actual climate just uh, actual climate action. So these hundred billion dollars were were what was agreed in Paris, uh, and uh, and and they were to be mobilized by 2020, and 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 we weren't able to do it, and and Glasgow had to basically recognize uh, this was a shortfall and had to renew a commitment. Uh, from the industrialized countries to uh, sort of really pay their dues uh, and the first share of, of, of funding uh, to finance climate action in developing countries. Um, again, this is never going to be enough. Uh, and I think uh, one element that is very important for young generation in developing countries to remember and to have very clear is that international climate fund uh, and funding will only be able to cover a small amount of the, the sort of needs to decarbonize the economy going forward. And so the most important portion of this funding will be from the national budget and will be redirecting flows that are now invested in uh, perhaps uh, unsustainable energy subsidies, for instance, into 
uh, a use that is more compatible uh, uh, to, to achieve objectives in terms of resilience and objectives in terms of, uh, of decarbonization. And, and uh, um, Jnaya mentioned it, the very high cost of fuel in Jamaica, and not just in Jamaica, the whole Caribbean is the one of the spaces globally where, uh, where fuel has the highest cost and not just fuel, electricity. We're talking about 40 cents for kilowatt hour, which is about 200% more than what they pay in the US. And so there has to be a way for Jamaica to kind of cut their dependence on importing this fuel. And so uh, again, the, there is, uh, there are some funding available from the international community to support that initial shift, but eventually it will have to be a whole of economy, whole of government approach in the developing countries uh, that uh, sort of will have to um, try and take a holistic approach on, 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 on redirecting some of the domestic funding uh, available. Because if we're just waiting for uh, international climate funds to solve the entire process, problem. I'm, I'm afraid we're not gonna get too far. It's just not gonna happen, is it? No, it needs, it needs to be done on a very broad front, globally and nationally, and even you know, within nations. I think it's got to be done. Everybody has their part to play here. Just very briefly, Philip, could you just explain um, your organization, Global Environment Facility? Because not everybody may have, may have heard of Absolutely. it. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. So when the 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 UN Convention, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, was created, this was uh, 1992. Um, basically, the, the 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 reason why the convention was created was to agree on a way forward to tackle climate change. Uh, at that point, uh, basically, we were um, setting up a system where all countries were embarking in some kind of climate action. However, there was a very clear recognition that some country had to pay more than others. Uh, and there's something in the convention that is called the principle but common, of common but differentiated responsibilities. So this is like one of the cornerstone of climate justice and climate justice, as you well know, can be intended at very different levels. So climate justice at community level, there's a intergenerational climate justice, and then there's a climate justice between states, between nations. Uh, and these in, when you talk about climate justice between nations, uh, some nation needs to be given space to develop. And, and nations that have developed already need to be sort of providing some space or some financial resources to allow for that development. And so as a compromise, under the convention and not just for climate, but also for biodiversity and also for the convention on desertification. Uh, um, the parties and countries and nation in the Rio summit, the Rio Hearth summit in 92, decided to create a financial mechanism that it's, it's the GEF, it's the Global Environment Facility. And this financial mechanism is basically uh, um, a pot of money um, that gets replenished every four years uh, from uh, a group of countries that are generally um, industrialized and, and, and are sort of the, uh, un, the, the Annex I countries, meaning those who have uh, access to resources. But more and more, we actually have seen some countries like China and South Africa contributing to the facility as well. So um, the, the way that it, the facility works is we collect donations every four years. And then we, we, we are a small group of people, about 70 people in Washington DC that are the secretariat for this uh, fund, which is hosted at the World Bank. And uh, um, I lead the climate change component of this fund. And uh, we write an investment strategy. So we consult with all of the constituencies and developing countries and donors. And we try to come up with what are the most pressing needs, both on the mitigation side and on the adaptation side that we need to serve uh, in the next four years? And I give you an example. In the, uh, in the mitigation side, um, we have decided that um, large scale grid connected solar panels and wind energy no longer needs public subsidy. So the private sector can already 
find profit in those type of projects. So the funds from the Global Environment Facility are no longer justified in that type of technology. Uh, however, uh, for example, electric vehicles or energy efficiency are still technology that are not picked up as much as we would like to see in uh, developing countries. So we are providing uh, availability of resources to developing countries that decide to use their GEF resources for these two elements, electric mobility and, and, and energy efficiency. So basically we have a menu of option. Each nation has an ex ante um, initial allocation of resources from the GEF. So the GEF gets about $5 billion uh, for four years. These $5 billion are divided in, in pieces um, so that each country gets their fair share of allocation. And this is based on elements such as um, the GDP, the, the population, uh, the, the state of economic development, and the amount of environmental risks and environmental resources that can be protected um, with the Jeff money. So once we have determined these, for example, Jamaica will have $20 million. Uh, Jamaica will have. Uh, will, I'd like. I'd like. Twenty million dollars, Janae. Excellent. How much for the Seychelles? Do you know? The Seychelles will have. I'm not on top of my head, but at least fifteen million dollars. Is what I'd really like to do is to ask Anthea and Janae. Okay, we know there's a problem in the small island developing states. Here's some money. What do you think are the most urgent problems that money could be put towards? You know, is is there a sort of a, a unity within your states? So this is where it should go? I, I don't know. I'm interested to hear from you guys. So right now, I would say that there are lots of different ideas as to what the money would possibly be used for. Probably some people would say that maybe the money would be best used to secure um, food security in our country since a lot mm -hmm. of the food prices are going up due to drought. Um, some other people might say that we should use those funds to secure riverbanks because when it actually does rain and then it's flooding then you have a lot of floods that destroy a lot of the housing and then maybe others might go and say that the money should instead be used towards giving loans like small loans in our own country to small businesses so that they're able to go and secure their own finances and be able to create sustainable and climate change considered solutions for the customers. They may also thereafter consider, well, this money is going to finish fast. <laughs> but at this rate, um, what else could they go and consider with this? They might go and say with this money, they should create systems to go and track progress and communicate between the different arms of government so that it's not just one ministry that is focused on climate change, but instead, the Ministry of Finance should be considering these things. The Ministry of Climate Change, because we do have a Ministry of Climate Change in Jamaica. The Ministry of Job Creation, the Ministry of Education should go and use this money to actually put it in all the different subjects and programs for students from the primary level all the way up to the tertiary level and make that even maybe a common course at the university so that everyone is educated. Use this money towards um, advertising and marketing this information on national TV and on radio and even the social media arms or platforms for the government so that many, many and everyone will be able to actually be aware of it and so that could at least fix the information deficit that we are facing in our country. There's many, many uses definitely because it is a problem, evidently, the fact that we don't have the money. But I, I'm aware of actually the GEF and their programs that we have here. As you said, the $20 million. I didn't know the exact amount of money, so thank you for that. But I do know that currently we are using the money right now for youth-led projects across the country, specifically youth-led projects for climate change. And in some schools, they've been using it for small kitchen-type gardens there so that those underserved schools are able to feed their students since we also have problems doing that as well. So that's what we would do with the money. <laughs> Fascinating. Thank you. Yes. Althea, have you got anything to add to that? Uh, 
Jose shows, I believe that uh, we should secure our bread and butter, our coast, and maybe have some mitigation for that. And as a um, uh, environmental engineering focused on the coastal engineering, I would say to try to build uh, um, barriers, things like that, that's uh, on the soft engineering side that will protect our coast as well, because a lot of our islands have coastal erosion, or they are just uh, disappearing because of sea level rise. We can't do much about sea level rise. And also in our education system as well, it will be good to get some funding there because right now everyone is aware about climate change through extracurriculars, especially our younger children. But if we have it in our official educational curriculum, it will be really helpful as well. Yes, I, I think education is, is part of the answer for this, isn't it? Definitely, we've got to essentially sow the seeds in the younger generation to bring through an awareness of this. And as we've been speaking, if you've been following the chat, Filippo has very kindly uh, posted a link to um, Youth Action Experiences Small Grants programmes. So Filippo, perhaps you could just briefly explain what that's all about. Sure, I mean, so many interesting points from, from both my fellow panelists that I don't even know where to start with. I get, a, I get very sort of excited and passionate when, uh, when we hit some of these, uh, these elements. Um, I would say, you know, unfortunately, and and I think Jaya mentioned, um, uh, for instance, um, uh, sort of like food crisis, which is um, uh, a very very important uh, problem. Uh, but for us at the Jeff, we have to at least remain within the burden, the, the, the boundary of, of of climate and and environment. So we wouldn't be able to serve food crisis unless it was linked, for example, with sustainable agriculture. Unless we wanted to uh, sort of make agriculture more resilient to uh, impact of climate change, which, by the way, is an area of uh, climate action quite significant uh, at the moment for us. Everything that is related to uh, recuperation of degraded land, uh, um, uh, agroforestry systems, etc. But um, so going back to the question from Barry, I, I, I shared the link of a publication that uh, summarizes a little bit the experience of uh, one particular program of the Jeff, which is called the Small Grant Program. It's a particularly agile um, sort of way to disburse small amount of funding to local uh, NGOs and youth organizations, as opposed to the larger ticket uh, uh, sort of grants and, and loans that we give to governments. Because the, the, the sort of access channel to the Jeff is uh, the government. Uh, so normally is uh, the Ministry of Environment or the Ministry of Finance. Um, but uh, then we also have this small grant program that is uh, managed by uh, local organization. Uh, organizations and so in that way can serve and perhaps be better suited to some of the um, elements that both uh, Antia and, and Jai were mentioning with regard to for example education with regard to uh, you know making information available to a large amount of uh, uh, people uh, focusing on the youth uh, and the results that can be achieved by the way through that type of small investment are not are not necessarily small at all so uh, we we definitely encourage uh, encourage that and then i wanted to go back to uh, another point that uh, anjai mentioned which i think is crucial uh, which is uh, coordination between uh, different parts of uh, the government and generally civil society within the same country uh, and 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 we've seen uh, several times uh, different ministries uh, adopting policies that are not compatible with each other, uh, and uh, policies that row in different directions. Uh, so there is an element that we are really putting on the agenda for this Jeff cycle, which starts in July this year for the next four years, which relates to supporting policy coherence in developing countries. Uh, and I say in developing countries, just not because it's not important, as important in developed country, but just because developing countries is, is my uh, sort of area of, of interest and work. Um, and so policy coherence means, how do we ensure that is a coordinated climate 
action that starts from the Ministry of Planning and the Ministry of Finance, and then goes downstream to all of the ministries that are um, responsible to uh, promote um, uh, adaptation or to reduce emissions. And I'm talking about energy. So I'm talking about agriculture and I'm talking about industry and transport. Uh, you cannot have a long-term decarbonization strategy that is adopted by the Ministry of Environment and then have the Ministry of Finance that decides to, uh, with energy, decide to increase energy subsidies for diesel import. So in some way, and, and you cannot have the Ministry of Agriculture that decide to chop forests to make more space for uh, grazing and beef production. So there has to be, a, and I think in many countries, this does not yet exist, a multi-ministerial coordination platform where decisions are taken, taking a look at all the parts of the economy and directing funding from organizations such as the GEF in the way that can sort of provide an oiling mechanism, uh, uh, an oiling function for this coordination uh, coordination platform that 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 um, I'm very passionate about and I think is the is the key to an effective long-term decarbonization and 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 resiliency strategy. Uh, and so we will be focusing a lot of our resources in the next four years to do just that. Thank you. It's coming close to the end of our, our hour. It's flown by, of course. Isn't it? I'd really like to get a few questions from our audience, if that's possible, guys. Um, you can either type them into chat, or I think if you raise your hand, uh, Eva or Kirsty can let, put you on screen, if you prefer. So over to the audience. Any questions from you guys so far? Um, hi, I wanted to ask you, uh, coming from a country that has a lot of corruption, I wanted to ask you uh, if uh, 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 we wanted to uh, 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 come uh, uh, to we want to speak our voices uh, to uh, our countries uh, where uh, there's so much uh, corruption that uh, our politicians don't even want uh, to uh, listen uh, to our, uh, our ideas or something else uh, if there's no trade-off or something else. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm not sure if you understand my question because I wasn't really, uh, I can repeat my question. Did you, did you understand the question, guys? Is anybody prepared to take it on? Filippo, go ahead. Yes, I mean, I. I I I I'm I, I completely understand the question, and uh, you know, from uh, from my standpoint, again, uh, the 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 global environment facility um, is there to cover environmental costs. Um, so we don't necessarily uh, participate to programs that have to do with strengthening the institutional framework and establishing rules to rule out. Uh, corruption as a as a practice. However, we do have very strong fiduciary and procurement standards uh, of what when we when we provide funding to a government, we have a very uh, sort of strict way to track the use of this funding, uh, and uh, uh, the government has to commit to uh, um, independent evaluations that we run uh, both at midterm and at the end of uh, a specific program or project uh, to check that uh, the resources that we have provided have been used according to the agreement that we had with them at the beginning. Then that only covers the small amount of funding that we provide. So the rest of the problem might still be there, but uh, I hope that young folks such as yourself can, can really sort of uh, support a generational change uh, and, and a change of practices uh, in, 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 in some in your countries and some of your countries uh, to finally get out of, of, of unsustainable and, and, and uh, malicious corruption practices. Thank you. Thank you. Janae, Anthea, any, any comments? I would like to add to what Filippo said. 
Concerning governments, yes, lots of governments may have more corrupt practices, but it is then for maybe the private sector in our countries to go and put forward more sustainable and climate considered solutions in that case. If you can put pressure on the private sector, then it's more likely then that they'll be more inclined to say, okay, we're going to stop using fossil fuels. We're going to be using renewable energy because consumers will stop buying from us if we don't do that. Or if the consumers go and say that they are going to protest against these privately owned but monopolists, for example, a electrical company or a water company, and they're not maintaining their resources in a proper fashion, then with protests from the community, they might be able to go and change their ways, if you will. And along those lines, so maybe it's not only the government that can take action, it's also the people, and it's also corporations, particularly the very large corporations, if they're locally owned, it's even more likely to be able to take action. Okay, so this is a bit harder to force foreign owned companies, unfortunately, to take action in the developing world. But for corporations and the private sector, if you go and put a hard emphasis against them, then maybe that's when they'll be able to go and make some changes against whatever the government may or may not be doing at any time. Yeah, yeah, okay. Excellent, thank you. Anthea, have you got anything to add to that? Um, I agree with Filippo and uh, Jamie. I just want to add that also we can use our education. If you come, you go study and prove scientifically that this is wrong, maybe that will be a backup as well to support your idea and bring forward uh, your concerns as well. Okay, thank you. Now, do we have any more questions from the audience? You're welcome to pop one in. We've just got time. If not, I've got a final final question for everybody. I have, I have a question. Oh, sorry, Eva. Antea, thanks for sharing your journey on becoming a climate justice activist. And I understand TSL is involved there too. And as far as I understand, you were involved with an in-person TSL event. Would you share a little bit about your experience on uh, your in-person TSL event experience and this year online experience? And Janae mm -hmm. as well. And Janae, Janae too, yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you for your question, Eva. I'm not sure how much I remember from 10 years ago, how it is <laughs> like um, uh, from the TSL event. I guess it's all about the experience and having the live feedback from the other debaters there and trying to figure out how to put forward our ideas and concerns, how to save the world, we can say. And uh, about this year, I'm doing it online. It was nice to see what other young people ideas they have um, uh, nowadays and uh, to be a moderator, to listening, to learn from other workshops and uh, uh, the panel discussions as well. And from the debaters, I learned a lot of things and it was quite different, I guess. But overall, I guess the goal is achieved that I learned something, information are shared and things like that. Thank you. Jeanette, what about you? So for me, my experience, I thought it was a great experience because we were able to have people from all over the world to come together and have discussions. This is what Anthea was saying, that you come together and trying to come up with solutions basically to save the world. For my year, we were talking about building sustainable cities and we had the opportunity to be going and looking at the sustainable city that was being created in Abu Dhabi. And I saw technology that I never heard of before at that point in time. And it got me very, very interested when I came back to Jamaica to go and share that information with other people to say that, you know, we can come up with very interesting and very unique solutions that fit our local circumstances. Because for one of them, they built the building in such a way that it controlled airflow so you wouldn't have to use as much electricity and power 
to cool down the actual building. And what if we did that here? You know, Jamaica is also a tropical country. So I thought that that was very interesting. So that was what I took back from my experience. There are many different opinions, many different views all across the world, and you can learn from each other. Excellent. Difficult to replicate online, sadly. Um, Kirsty, you have a question for us. I do, yes. Thank you, panelists. That was a really, really interesting discussion. And I we've discussed a lot about the challenges and the difficulties um, that surround this topic. But I wonder if you could perhaps give us a, a final thought on what gives you hope that socioeconomic equality and climate justice can be achieved. Goodness, who wants to tackle that one, guys? <laughs> Filippo, well done. Well, I, I, I can start. Um, I mean, I, I think the, the, the landscape of engagement of the public and especially of young people uh, has changed enormously over the, over the time that, you know, I'm, I'm still a young person, but uh, over, the time that I've been, uh, over the time that I've been working on climate change, which is many years, uh, the amount of enthusiasm, energy, knowledge, uh, has uh, increased, uh, uh, you know, enormously, and so I've from 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 being around people that knew absolutely nothing about climate change, about the problem, about possible solutions, uh, and I'm not talking about young people. I'm talking about other people. It, back uh, 15, 20 years ago, we are now in a much much better place. So if I had to, uh, uh, you know, pick one thing about hope is. Uh, the, the fact that we are having this conversation and that we have two young, smart uh, 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 people joining from their countries, very clear ideas. Uh, and, and to have that debate, that, that, that cult, the sort of awareness and knowledge developing at national level, I think is, is fundamental. And I think is going to significantly give us and put us give us more chances and put us on a, on a much better course. Um, you know, at the end of the day, our timeline now is 2030. And so in 2030, the people on this on these, on these, uh, panel will be young adults and, and they will be uh, sort of in charge of part of their governments. They will be in charge of part of the private sector. Uh, and, and, and so that gives me a lot when I started. Um, so that's my thought. Thank you, Felipe. Anthea, Janae, you must be hopeful. There must be something that gives you hope. Anybody? Anthea? Uh, I'll go first. I think Janae is stuck or something like that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I to what Philip said, that uh, um, now it's different from before. We have information, we have access to information, the internet maybe it's not always good, but it's still there. We can go out there and look for ourselves if uh, our education system fails us or something like that. Uh, we can, I think maybe, not so near, maybe we can fix it. There are obviously some things that we might not be able to fix it completely, but can be done and we can uh, get closer to the climate justice we are we all imagine thank you Anthea. Uh, Janae you dropped out for a moment would you like to comment on on this issue yeah I dropped out yeah. but I am back now <laughs> great you're good so what good. brings hope in this circumstance I think it's a very practical thing unfortunately but maybe for a good reason we're starting to see a lot of the problems for climate change now the increase in temperature the extreme droughts, the flooding, all of that, we're seeing that. And that's starting to make people question, is that yes, you know, climate change is actually a real thing. We need to start focusing on it and trying to put pressure on the government, whether or not they take as much action as we think that they ought to, that's a different thing. But more and more you're starting to see the action because people are becoming more aware and trying to educate themselves even beyond what the formal education system has to offer us because we're seeing all these changes. And because of that, I'm starting to see different policies in place, for example, banning plastics, for example, or reducing the, uh, having fish certain type of fishing seasons so that the fishes are able to 
revitalize and come back, basically. Fishes that used to maybe be burden on an endangerment are starting to be able to come back because of economic reasons. They used to, there were, okay, for economic reasons, they were being overfished. And then clearly people started seeing this was a problem and they put pressure on the government and the government started putting systems in place so that you could have sustainable fishing instead. And therefore, I'm starting to see hope because people are seeing that, yes, if we do not do something now, then there won't be much to hope for in the future. So we have to take action now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I told you the hour would fly by. It's gone. Extraordinary. We could have been here for another two hours, I suspect, and still kept on interesting discussions. But I think we should we should probably close it there. Um, I think uh, if anybody has a particular question they want to raise with one of the panelists, I'm sure if they email Kirsty, she'll be able to put them in touch directly. I'm sure you'll be happy to uh, conduct future discussions by email on this one. Um, so thank you very much, panelists. Fascinating discussion, really interesting. And uh, it's really a pleasure to hear your wide diversity of experiences and, and concerns here. That's very helpful, I think, for our audience. Um, so I'm gonna bring the discussion to a close and hand back to Kirsty. Kirsty, are you there? I am wonderful. Thank you very much, Barry, for leading that really interesting discussion. And again, thank you, panelists, for sharing such a broad range of views. I'm glad we were able to have you to represent the SIDS and represent uh, young people on how we can consider socioeconomic and climate justice for everyone. Uh, so I'm afraid, everybody, that brings us to the close of our 2022 Partner Power Summit. I'm going to ask Eva if she can bring Carl up as well, because we've got a little finishing section we want to do with you. But huge thank you to our panelists. You're welcome to stay for this section. Eva has very kindly made a highlights of the week, which we want to share with everyone, just to say a final goodbye and thank you as well. Uh, so I'll give Eva a moment to pop, or I can probably pop Carl up on screen. There we go. Welcome, Carl. Can you hear us? Hello, I can hear you and I can see you. Wonderful. Any thoughts, Carl, on our final panel? Oh, amazing. Thank you for taking such a massive, huge topic and trying to unpack it and unpick it and make it understandable for everyone. Thank you so much. You're all great inspiration. Uh, Eva, panelists, you're welcome to stay for this part. If you would like to see the highlights of the week, we welcome you to do that. So. We've had a huge number of students, speakers, teachers, uh, supporters, parents, moderators, judges, panelists joining us this week. Uh, so Eva's created a wonderful little highlights video just for us to celebrate uh, the amazing week we've had so far as part of our 2022 Climate Justice Summit. So Eva, over to you. Thank you, Kirsty. I think it's like, I hope this debate the whole week or the whole month, I will say, will be a good beginning to put on our global justice hats or global justice wings in a way. And I have to say, this is not a professional video. I just keep a video diary for myself and I have a feeling it will have a meaning for everybody who's involved with this, to this year's student debates. So this is it, end of this year's summit. Everything has a beginning, has an end, I wanna say. And I am sharing the screen for the last time this year. I want to ask Kirsty one last time, can you see the screen? Yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's go. <laughs>
All right, this is it. Thank you, Emma. That was an amazing way to highlight and summarise what's been an incredible year for the Trust for Sustainable Living's 2022 climate justice. It all started way back in September. We had uh, 1,122 essays from students in 59 countries. That turned into 53 debaters from 33 countries. And over the last week, we've had speakers, moderators and judges from 23 different countries represented to join us. So it's been a truly global event. And we thank you everybody for your participation and for joining us this year to explore the difficult but very interesting and very important topic of climate justice. Carl, is there anything you want to add? Well, I just say a massive thank you to Barry for moderating today uh, and our wonderful panelists. Um, and, you know, Filippo made a comment about the, the need to replenish this GEF funds because we need to go from way more than 5 billion to way more than 100 billion. So, and we need the youth to help put that political pressure uh, on their governments because without that, without your votes, without your consumer power, we're not going to get there. So let's keep working together. It's been an absolute pleasure. You know, I'm amazed by the quality of the ideas from kids as young as seven to, you know, to 17. And uh, yeah, you never stop amazing me and keep up the great work. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Carl. A few final thank yous from us at TSL. Thank you to all of our moderators. Thank you to all of our judges, the speakers and panelists that have joined us this week. Thank you to our amazing Zoom team, Anthea, who's been a moderator. She's been a panelist. She's also been our Zoom team behind the scenes as well. And she's also done all the social media promotion for our event. So thank you massively to Anthea and Natalie, who's our other Zoom expert ever for putting all the videos together and doing all the Zoom links and all of the hard work and preparation with the students uh, and to Carl for his work and Barry for their support as well as moderators uh, throughout all of the sessions. Uh, thank you to the parents that have supported your students and your young people in participating in the competition. The teacher champions who have entered Many, many, many student essays, many student videos and have supported the students through their two or three weeks worth of training and preparation we've had for the debates. And finally, of course, a huge thank you to all the students and young people that have taken part in the competition this year. We are incredibly impressed with the ideas you have put forward and we're very much looking forward to seeing the actions that you start taking now. We've had this week exploring climate justice a bit further to move your ideas forward. Um, and we look forward to welcoming you to next year's competition as well. So keep your eyes on the TSL website or the TSL community platform, tsl.earth for updates in September as to the topics we're gonna to be exploring in 2023. So thank you very much everyone for joining us. This is the end of the TSL 2022 Partner Power Summit on Climate Justice, but we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.